about what the Word of God really says, because that's all that matters. It doesn't matter what I think, or anybody else in this room, it matters what you say about this. So Lord, open our minds, open our ears, open our hearts. Lord, speak to that one person that doesn't love you as Lord and Savior, so that they'll see that that's their destination, unless they choose Christ, because that's what you say. So Lord, we celebrate life in Jesus. We celebrate this time that we come together to open up the Holy Word of God that we may know, that we may know, that we may know where we're going to spend eternity. That's the question. We ask this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Once you turn to your neighbor and say, it's really not going to be that bad this morning. <laughs>
I mean, one of this is that we, we said this, is that we live in a world where sin is, is freely exploited. In other words, that we live in a world where sin just kind of is, you know, everybody sins and, you know, some sins are good sins, some sins are bad sins, some sins aren't so bad. And so we live in this world where we minimize sin. And because of that, we minimize the consequences of sin, which means that hell's getting a lot, lot smaller in this country to the Word of God. Okay? And so we, we look at that, we live in a world where sin is uh, freely exploited. And then we look at the second thing is, is that we have now have a worldview that believes tolerance and opinions mean more than truth. In other words, there's no absolute truth. So, so whatever, whatever you think becomes truth and reality. And since there's no absolutes, then we hold the Word of God. And the Word of God says this is the absolute truth. And we go, well, that's not my opinion. And so our opinions become valuable and either supersede what God says is true. Do you understand that? We just tolerate it. And we just say, well, you know, that's their opinion, that's their feeling, that's their experience, and that becomes reality, and that's not true. I tell you, if you want to grip on reality, you must, ex you must understand eternity, and eternity always brings us to the reality of what is true. You know, it's not just what's around us now, it's how we're going to spend eternity. And then we began, last Sunday, we began to look at three objections. We only looked at one, I promise you, we're only going to look at one again today. I have the second one in my notes here. I'm prepared to preach it. No way, Jose, that we're going to get that far. That's all the Spanish I know. The first one we did with the object. Why? Why have we distanced ourselves from the reality of hell? Here's, here's, here's another reason. Is that we just object to it. We don't like it. It makes us uncomfortable. And all these emotions, emotional things, not logistics or spiritual things, but emotionally, we object to hell. And by the way, if you're here and you don't somewhat object to hell, uh, just check your spirit box because that means you're, you're pretty hard. Because there's people that are going to hell, and if you just, you know, it doesn't bother you that people go to hell, there's something wrong with your spirit. I question if you're going to believe in Jesus if you just doesn't bother you that somebody goes to hell. That's why Jesus came, and that's why we're here. Amen? Y'all hear that? Okay. All right. And so we object to hell because. You know, we just don't feel good. So the first thing we looked at is we object to the reality of hell is because this thought of how can a loving God send people to hell? That's a big one, isn't it? We looked at that for an hour or so. You know what? A loving God, and it's a contradiction. It's almost like a blemish on, on our image of God. We said God is love and mercy and forgiveness and grace and all of these. And then we kind of put hell in there. We said, man. God, you're bipolar here. That, that's a contradiction. We make a judgment call that God is not loving, and yet His character says God is love. First John says that He does nothing outside of that character of His love, and yet we understand it because we say that looks unloving to us. Therefore, God, that's an unloving thing that you do. So, how can a loving God send anyone to hell? I'm not going to preach that again, but you can go away. The second thing, and here's where we're going to land this to, the se second objection is, is that hell is too extreme of a punishment for the crime. We're going to talk about that. And then the third objection, do we have all those in there? Yeah. Yeah, I'm basically a decent person and shouldn't deserve hell. That's what we're going to look at next Sunday. That's a tough one too, isn't it? I'm worn out preaching these sermons because I mean, these are hard questions. And I wrestle with them. And I write notes and I leave them for, for four or five days. I come back to it and I go, oh, I really said that. So I wrestle with this to, to say these things, but, but, but I want to identify these. And let me tell you the one reason. Listen, if you're a believer in this room, I want to talk to you. If you're a believer in this room, we're going to be accountable to understand this doctrine of reality of hell. You know why? A lot of people aren't believing. And so all this has been to kind of help us when we have these conversations with those that, well, I don't know if I believe in hell. Hopefully this information is going to help you with the discourse and the conversation with those when you confront them about the reality of hell. Do you understand that? And I'm going to tell you, this conversation is going to be more and more and more because more people are believing that hell does not exist. Do you understand that? I'm seeing that in the church. I was going to say outside of the church. In the church, this conversation is more and more. So, so hopefully, you're going to be accountable. By the way, anytime the Word of God is preached, you're held accountable to the Word of God. And so, uh, hopefully you see this. Now, when I look at this, 
I looked at this and I, I wrote this down. I want to show you some things that I kind of discovered in this. I said it last Sunday, but I didn't have it in writing. I wanted to show you this before we dive into number two. Joe, flash this, buddy. I'm going to show you some problems with these objections, those three of them. Here's the first one. When we begin with these objections, notice this. Look at this. When we begin with these objections, God's too loving. You know? Uh, and I'm basically a decent person. Isn't it kind of extreme that punishment for eternal damnation and, and torment? Isn't that all of this, when we put these objections, notice the common denominator in all this is that we're putting God's actions or His ways into submission to our own understanding, right? I just don't understand that God would do this. And so therefore, if I don't understand it, how can He really do this? And so I don't think God would ever do this because I can't understand it. Do y'all see what we're doing there? We put God under under my own personal opinion and my subjection, and, and he submitted to my thoughts. And I don't think God would do that. Do you hear the, the vainness in that? Do you know who we're dealing with? We're dealing with God here. God can do whatever he wants to do. He doesn't need your blessings or your permission. Do you understand that? Some of you, really? He does. <laughs> he can do whatever he wants to do. And so when we begin to object to these truths in the Word of God, we are putting our opinions, our notions, our thoughts, our emotions, our intellect in submission under, over the submission of God's will in ways and thoughts the way that He does that. We'll end up on the scripture verse next week. Alright, the second thing that I want to say about this too is that uh, there's no consequences for our actions or choices. When I noticed all this, I said, so we can do whatever we want to do. It doesn't really matter what we so there's no consequences. We kind of live in that society, don't we, today? You know, we teach our children that, oh, little Johnny, he's okay. Teacher brings you in. He did, little Johnny did something. You go, well, he didn't mean to. It was an accident, and parents just kind of excuse that. You know what? Okay? We're more concerned with his emotional state than, than being right, than doing the right thing. Okay. How's that working for us? We showed the other problem that I saw with these objections. Pride. We're so proud. We're so, so prideful here. When I began to write these sermons, uh, I thought I had the answers, and so I had to back up and say, Lord, man, forgive me for my pride. So I approached this with humility. And, and I, I found a scripture verse that kind of indicated that Jeremiah uh, chapter uh, 66, verse 2. It says, All these things that that I have made with my hands. This is, what God, this is God speaking. I've made all these things with my hand, with my hands. I mean, He personally took, took care with making all the things that we see around us and with care He made this. And it came to be, says God. But then when He says this, I love this part, but I will search, and that word search means I will continually search and continually seek. I will always look for those that, 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 that are humble before me and tremble at my words. And so I began to pray that prayer in my life as I prepared this. I said, Lord, keep me humble before you. And Lord, let me tremble when I read these scripture verses about heaven. So, so pride cannot be an element in this when we look at the doctrine of hell. Okay, objection number, objection number one was we looked at, well, isn't God just too loving to send anyone to hell? We looked at that. Now let's look at the second objection that we're going to do. Hell is too extreme of a punishment for the crime. <laughs> Hell is just too extreme of a punishment for the crime. Y'all kind of get that? I mean, think about this. I mean, the idea of hell is unjust, but for a finite sin, a mistake that we've made at a, at a last moment in our life, a, you know, a, a thing that we look back and say, man, if I was just thinking I would have done that, and it's a sin, and so this 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 <laughs> this finite sin that I committed, I'm going to infinitely pay the punishment of that. It just seems unfair, doesn't it? I mean, a moment. I mean, as a parent, your child when when they disobey you, do you put them in timeout forever? <laughs> Anybody in this room? No. <laughs> CP. <laughs> CPS would be at your house, right? What's that kid doing? He's been there for a year, right? <laughs> my, my grandson got in trouble with me and I sat him in the corner. And 
and uh, his dad came in, and, and uh, my little my grandson said, Dad, guess what Pops did to me? <laughs> and I said, this ought to be good. He said, I had to sit in the corner for four and a half hours. And so it was about 22 minutes. You know? <laughs> so the dad looked at me, and I thought, yeah, and they had four and a half hours. You know? <laughs> Keep the kids anymore. But anyway, no. Your dad is true. So he sat there for 20 minutes. It seemed like four and a half hours. You ever been there? You know, you know. And so, so, so when we, in our logistic thinking, we say, man, hell, that's, that's just an extreme punishment. It's not fair. And so now these new theologians and this new teaching is trying to get God off the hook. They're, they're thinking that, well, we're going to get God off the hook now. Hell is not for eternal, but hell is on the earth. And hell is for purgatory. And hell is just for a short time. And they're trying to get God off the hook. But you know what they're really doing? They're undermining God's majesty and His glory and His righteousness and His judgment and His holiness. They're undermining that. Because God is holy. God is righteous. And so, so this new thought is, well, you know, well, surely God doesn't really mean that. Isn't that, isn't that Satan's plan from the very beginning? Yeah. You know, we read this in Genesis, how, how, how he tempted him. He says, oh, God didn't really mean that. Remember how he does that? And then he comes to Jesus and he does the same thing. Hey, you know, go ahead and do this. You know, we shorten your time on the earth and, you know, and all the nations will bow down. Do you see that Satan's plan has changed? Undermined into... Uh, to distraught us from, from really understanding what is true. Now, just like I said with a child, you know, if you've ever had a young child in your house and you've had to punish them, you know, and, and you as a father or, or as a mom or as a parent, you come to that child and say, listen, you know, what you did, you broke the rules and, you know, I'm going to punish you this way. Whether you take something away or time out or grounding or, or spanking or whatever, and what is that that immature child says to you? You were so mean to me. <laughs> right? I mean, y'all have that? I mean, how about how many lived after they said that to you? <laughs> Say so what? You're so mean to me. You know, where did that come from? Immaturity, right? Because now we as parents, right? We we go. Now I understand, I understand that now, now that I'm mature and have kids and grandkids, obviously, that I understand that principle there. But as immature, I go, you're so mean to me, or, or that child says, you're so mean to me, because why? They're so unfair. And you're their dad, you're their mom, you're supposed to protect them, you're supposed to let them do fun things, you're supposed to, you know, uh, understand when they make mistakes, and yet when you call them to consequences, all of a sudden that punishment you are so totally blind. The universe revolves around that child, right? That's that immature thinking, right? So the, the universe is going to stop because they're in time out, right? That's what they're thinking. And this is the mentality of this, this objection here is, isn't hell a little bit too extreme here? Like you're so up here. Do you see the immaturity of that? And probably most of us are true. We're not really clear here. And hopefully we can clear that up so that we, we don't really buy into this lie from Satan. So the objection, hell is, is too extreme uh, of punishment. Here's some things that I thought about this. I, I really think we do not have an understanding about three natures. First of all, we don't have an understanding about the nature of God himself. God is a righteous God. God is a holy God. God is a just judge is what Scripture says. We don't understand the nature of God. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. The second thing that we have a problem with that, that objection is we don't understand the nature of man. Listen, the nature of man says that, that we're sinners. That we're not going to choose righteousness. We're not going to choose the right thing. We're, we're going to do the best we can a lot of times, but overall, we are carnal. We choose the things of the world when we're left by ourselves, right? Ask your children when you leave home. With teenager, teenage, teenage, teenagers, 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 when you leave home, what do they do? They throw the wild party, right? I'm just talking on y'all's behalf. None of my kids said that, of course. I mean, but I don't. That problem. But what happens is because that immaturity is true, we do that because we choose those things when we're left to ourselves. The nature of man 
It's simple. We don't choose righteousness. We don't choose what's right. We do the best we can. But we don't. And then the third thing is we don't understand the nature of sin. We just kind of look at sin like, it's not that bad, is it? Or we compare ourselves with others. Well, I'm not like so-and-so over there that does this and this. I, I didn't hate that person out loud just like they did. They cussed them out. I really do hate them with my heart, but I didn't say it out loud, so I'm not that bad. Do you see what I'm saying about the sin? And Jesus comes along and blows everybody out of the water if you think it in your heart. Sin. So see, our neck, that, that this, this nature of sin, we don't really treat it that way. In fact, we excuse it, we ignore it. Say, surely we don't deserve that. Here's what happens with this. Well, we don't have the, the right understanding about God's nature, the nature of man, the nature of sin. Here's what results in that when we sin, you have to understand this truth to remember this. That when we sin, we sin against an infinite God that demands infinite punishment. I need to say it one more time because that's kind of my that. that when we sin, we sin against an infinite, eternal God. And that punishment demands an infinite, eternal punishment. Do you understand that? Did that is that good? Did you understand that? Something good, but did you understand that? Why is that? Because God is holy. God is righteous. He is glorious. He is perfect. And He's eternal. I'm going to explain that a little bit more at the very end. So kind of really catch this, because this will change. I think this is what changed me about some things here. Now, let's read this truth statement. There it is. Very good. Here's the truth about this. Hell is a very clear statement to us about the greatness and the majesty of God. Let's say it again. Let's read that out loud so y'all get that so I can drink some water. Ready? True. Hell is a very clear statement to us about the greatness and majesty of God. Satan's plan all along to undermine God. He began to confiscate and skim off the top of the praises of angels to undermine God. Do you not think he's still at that work, church? Do you not think he's still at that work? And so the majesty of God, he's undermining that. The greatness of God, he's undermining that. He's trying to convince us God's really not that great. His majesty, his glory is not really that great. He's undermining that and convincing us that that. You know, hell is really not that big a deal. Sin is not really that big a deal. The way that you live your life is not that big a deal. Your choices become truth, and that truth becomes a reality, and an absolute, and you can live however you think and however you experience, and it doesn't really matter, and that's contrary to the Word of God. And so, I'm just undermining God's greatness and His majesty. I want to say three things here about, about that. First of all, that's, that's uh, contradictory to this objection to that God is, you know, is this uh, eternal punishment a little bit extreme. First of all, we got to understand this. The case of the preacher is here. First of all, that God will not and cannot tolerate sin. He cannot, and He will not tolerate sin. Unlike what we think, we can do that, can't we? Well, that's not a big sin. That's a black lie. You know, that's not that big of a deal. That's that's okay if you do that, but don't try to do it again. And, and yet, here's what the Word of God says: God does not tolerate sin. Zero no tolerance. We do some scripture verses here. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 25. Therefore the Lord's anger burns against His people. His hand is raised. And He what? It's pretty aggressive, isn't it? Notice the emotional aspect that God, you know, we, we think God that have emotions. God has emotions here. Look, that's why I said His anger. Anger's a, what, an emotional term, right? It's very emotional. One of the guys that, that worked in my, uh, or, or uh, was in my youth ministry, became a pastor, youth pastor, and also subsidized his income, as most ministers have to do. And, uh, I don't know why I said that. But anyway, he, he was a policeman, and he told me this. I asked him, I performed his wedding ceremony after years of being in the police force. And, and I said, how's that working for you? He said, man, I love being a policeman. And I think he's in El Paso now, but I love being a policeman. But he said, the one thing I don't like doing is going to domestic domestic violence situation. I said, why is that? Because there's a lot of emotion there. There's anger that comes up. And boy, you never know what's going to happen here. 
about that motion in some ways, anger. This is what God is saying here. It may not be a good illustration, but, but here's what it's saying. God is angered against sin. Because why? He doesn't tolerate sin. He's got an investment that, that goes against sin, doesn't he? Remember Jesus, you know, died on the cross for what? Sin. So there's an investment, a great eternal investment that he has against sin. And so when we read that scripture verse, that he strikes the dead because why? God's anger burns. seven things that, you know, they say God hates these seven things, that, these seven manners of sin that's against Him. Talking about a haughty spirit and pridefulness and, and a false witness and, and when we when our feet, he, he says He hates our feet when we continually run toward wickedness and we run toward we run toward evil and, and pridefulize. There's seven things that you're going to be seven. And all these things, it says God hates, 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 hates. And all those, those are sins against Him. Another scripture verse, let me show you this one, 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 6. Let me read this to you. For God did not spare his angels when they sinned. I mean, think about this. Remember the fall of angels? Y'all know about that? Anybody? Uh, he didn't talk? No? Nobody's going to raise their hand. I'm supposed to know that. Good part. All right. For God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them into chains of darkness to be held for judgment. If he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on the ungodly people, we're protecting Noah, talking about the flood that's coming into the old world. And so, and so uh, uh, protecting Noah, preach of righteousness, and seven others. And if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes, and made them what? An example of what is going to happen to do. So here's the word God saying this, that before our time, God hated sin. And so when the angels revolted and Satan led them, all those fallen angels were gone. They were pushed out of heaven. Why? God does not tolerate sin. And then in the old world, in the, the beginning of the world, when God established that, what I've done in the you he removed them from the, the blessings of, of the Garden of Eden. And then we read about Noah in the days of Noah, when, when people turned against God. How did God deal with that? And then Sodom and Gomorrah. Do you see all that? Every time God says, I will not tolerate sin. And then notice what it says at the very end there. He says, did y'all not get this? This is an example that we can understand that God will not tolerate sin. There will be a day of judgment and consequences, church. I don't know who you are, where you've been in your life, but we will all stand before God one day. And so we're warned. This will happen to those who are ungodly. Isn't it ironic, this thing that we think that the extremity of the punishment of hell just seems so, so unfair. Would we not say that it would be unfair if God did not punish those that broke His law? I mean, God's the one that broke the law. They should not murder. They should not kill. They should not bear fun. All these laws. Wouldn't it be unfair if God just said, oh, well, Right? Second, God has limits to his mercy. Now, mercy is the word we understand that. I've taught you this. You've been around here for a while. Mercy just simply means we don't get what we really deserve. How many of y'all like mercy? <laughs> yeah. Because kids ever cry for mercy. You know? <laughs> and it didn't work. I mean, mercy is just we don't get what we deserve. We're really clear what the Word says. The Bible says that uh, all of sin, does it? What's the result of that sin? For all of sin against God. There's no one short of that, and we call them short of the glory of God. And then it says that the wages of that sin is what? Death. Yeah. Yeah, we've looked at that in the past. Death means what? Separation. Okay? And so we understand that, that in that, that statement that God makes, that all of sin... And all of all short of the glory of God. And then we have to understand what does that really mean about mercy? Here's a scripture verse, Isaiah chapter 55. Let me show you this. Right. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the 
wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts, let them turn to the Lord. And he will have what? Is there a value of your part? And here's the, we can read that and, and you must fully understand that there's limits to his mercy. There are times when God says, that's it. Hebrews is a scripture verse that says this, that Christ is not like a high priest who isolates himself. But he is one who that we can boldly come to the throne of grace in our time of need, and we will find grace and we will find mercy in our time of need. And what that means is that we must run to the Lord. We must come to Him. We must seek after Him while He can be found. Notice what I said, while He can be found, because there will be a point in time, and that is when eternal punishment is given, then there's no more mercy. There's no more grace given. There's nothing. Now here's what I've changed about what I've said to you several times, and I'm not going to say that again. And I understand my intention. I understand the thought with that. And scripturally, I understand that. But what I've convicted with this is, I've said this many times, that, that God's mercy and grace overshadows His judgment. Now that sounds, that sounds good, and, and there's some truth to that, but that's not an absolute truth. So I want to correct that with you, okay? Can I do that? <laughs> what really is, as I've been studying this, is that His grace and mercy are on this equal plateau of His judgment and His righteousness and the consequences of sin. And how I always wanted to look at that because I wanted people to be saved. I wanted them to receive mercy. I wanted them to receive grace. I said, come to Jesus. It doesn't matter what you've done. You do not want to have the punishment and the judgment of God. It's tormented. It's eternal. You don't want to go there. So notice that God, God's overshadowed His grace and mercy overshadows that if you'll just run to Him. And that's all true. But let me tell you now what I believe. He said, I believe that this mercy and grace is on this the same plane field. That you can run to God and you can turn to Him and you will find mercy and grace. Grace is that unmerited favor and mercy is you're not going to get what you deserve, which is what? Hell. That's what we all deserve. And you're not going to get this if you'll turn to me. But let me tell you, at one point, this judgment will come. It will come. It will come with a force the same as His mercy and His grace. So I'm, I'm nervous when I talk about this. I'm really nervous about this. Because I'm not seeing it that way. I always thought His mercy was greater. You know, God was, His character of grace and mercy is greater than this, but it's not. It's the same. And it scares me. Because this God of love could be a God of judgment. This God of righteousness can also be a God of mercy, absolutely, and they're the same characteristics. That's who God is. You all kind of get this? Yeah. Really, it was, it was a deep, just kind of a spiritual awakening in my life, and it continues to be. And, and uh, I think that's all I'm saying. Third thing. First of all, why, why do we kind of object to this? Why are there <coughs> some things we have to think about if we're really going to see that this eternal damnation really is an extreme, first of all, that God doesn't tolerate sin, and that God has a limit to His mercy. There will come a day where, where that stops. And third of all, all sin is directly against God. <laughs> we need to change the way that we look at sin. That all sin is directly against God. Let me show you that scripture verse, Psalms, verse 51. This is David speaking. Now, David, it's sin against God. If you're here this morning and you think, man, God would never forgive me for what I've done. He knows my secrets. Nobody else in this room may know my secrets of my darkness and my heart. But look up here. God sees it. Remember we looked at that scripture verse that it, when, when that judgment comes, He's going to judge the secrets of your heart. That nobody else knows it. That, no, that darkness is just there. Nobody knows you've got to cover it up. And nobody knows about this, but God knows your heart. Do you understand that? And you're going to stand before Him. And the Bible says you will stand before Him without an excuse. You're not going to say, but God, you can't do that. It won't happen. David was a murderer. That's pretty bad, what do you think? And David, 
committed adultery. Would you think that's pretty bad? All those things. And yet we find that David was used by God and loved by God. In fact, this acclamation of God, uh, David says that David was a man after God's own heart. Why is that? Because he repented. He confessed his sin. No matter what it was or how brave it looked, he confessed his sin. And notice how he dealt with this sin. Here's the kicker. Here's the kicker. He says, oh God, against you, against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you're rotting your burden and justified when you're jealous. Do you know what they can say to him? He's emptying himself out. He says, there's no excuse for what I've done. I deserve that judgment and that punishment, the consequences of what I've done. I accept that and I respond to that. Lord, because why? Because against Bathsheba, against his wife, against his children, against his kingdom as a king, none of that mattered. Do you know what mattered? He sinned against God. He's sinning against God. It's just God, you. It's you who sin against. He's a man after God's heart. Do you know, I can go back to being a father in this relationship because I think this kind of identifies us. You've had a, a child and they, you know, they eat a cookie and the chocolate's still dripping and they go, I didn't eat that. <laughs> <laughs> they made me. You had a child like that? Aren't they great to live with? Like? And then you have a child that comes in. Yeah, and they tell you something. You don't know about this, but I did this thing. I, I'm so sorry. I am, I am so sorry. Do you see the difference? You still love both. There's one who understands this principle. When you sin, you sin. God. We're going to get to this story. It, it's found in Luke chapter 15 or 16. I don't remember right now. It's found in Luke chapter 15 or 16. And you know this story. It's called The Rich Man and Lazarus. Yeah, 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 I know that story. Okay. All right. Okay. For you eight, I will tell that story. <laughs> anyway, Jesus tells this story. If anybody knows about hell and who's in hell, What's going on in hell? It would be Jesus. And he talks more about hell than anybody else in all of the Bible. You all understand that? We talked about that. And so he tells this parable, this story about hell. And when he tells this story about there was a there was a rich man and there was a poor man, Lazarus, okay? And uh, uh, both of them died. And then it says that the rich man, he went to hell. Some of the saddest words I've ever read. It says, and in hell, this man begins to have this conversation. And in this conversation, this, <coughs> this man who's in hell, and Jesus is telling the story, I noticed a couple of things here. We're going to go back to this and really kind of dive into this, but I just wanted to kind of highlight something here. That never once did that rich man cry out and say, listen, God, you are so unfair that I'm here in hell. Never once did that rich man say, I do not deserve this kind of punishment. That rich man never said, so, so, so what did I do to cause me to be here? That rich man never said, man, this is extreme type of punishment here. He never said any of those things. Why didn't he? I mean, if this is an objection to most of the world today, and if they say, well, man, isn't hell a little extreme? Can't we kind of modify this, this thing called hell? Can't we kind of cool it down? I mean, hell is pretty extreme here. Can't we just kind of smooth it over and build a big church here? More people embrace that than they will this, this doctrine of hell thing. And Jesus tells this story. And this rich man who's in hell, they never, ever protest why he's there. Never. And he's fully aware of what happened. And why he's there. I thought about that, and like I said, we're going to talk a little bit more about that. So we go back to this question and ramification of what we just said there with this parable that Jesus tells himself. Does hell sentence really fit the crime? Now can we be real honest here for, for I'm almost there to put up. Can we really be honest for seven minutes here? Can we? So I'm going to ask you a question. You've got to be honest. So I want to take a, an irrational approach here to have so much standards. I don't think, Joe, no more notes on that. When we take a rational thing, here's what I want to do. 
Do you agree with this? When there's a crime committed against a person, they ought to be punished. Yes or no? Yes. I'm seeing everybody shaking their heads. I'm saying no. So what have you done last week? Okay, anyway. <laughs> when somebody commits a crime to someone, do you think they should be punished? Yes. Yes. Is that right? Whatever the crime is, do you think they should be punished? Depends on the crime. So, so there's level of punishments and all that. Maybe you're talking about extreme punishment and all that, but I'm just talking about any type of discipline punishment. Pay a fine if you're speeding. If you're going, if you're going 80 miles an hour, you're 35. Like some of y'all do. And so, so if the police pulls you over and you get a ticket for a hundred dollars, is that punishment? Of course, yes. You should get a ticket. Of course, we're pleading mercy, aren't we? Well, we're pleading mercy. I know I deserve it, but I need mercy. But yeah, sometimes you get it, sometimes you don't. But uh, anyway. So, so my point is this, is that in, in our world, in our system that we have set up, laws that are set up, we say when you break the law and you break it against someone else, you ought to receive some sort of punishment. Yes or no? Yes. yes. Man, that took a lot of work. <laughs> It's evil, it's wicked. 
because of that, you can do whatever you want to do. Don't you think that the, the, when all the laws are off and all the rules are taken away, don't you think, you know what happens there? You know what it does? Because worse, does it? Because very worse. And in hell, I think that your sin doesn't get better. Your sins become worse. And a sinner who's in sin, who's in hell, just continues in that. And some of you are looking at me like, wow, that doesn't sound very good. What I'm saying is this, is that somebody who denies Christ as a Lord and Savior, they do not repent from that. In fact, I think they continue to rebel. They continue to hate God. They continue to, to hate Christ. They continue to reject. They continue to curse God. They continue this. Let me show you scripture verse Mark chapter 3, verse 29. He talks about this blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And in blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, he says it's an unforgivable sin, doesn't he? That you find in blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, and I think it means several things here, but basically it's denying uh, God who He is and saying, actually saying God is really evil and good things are evil and, and evil things are good. It's blasphemy against the goodness of God and His mercy. So I think God is just not a customer, but it, it's more than that. It's damnation toward others and damnation toward God in His goodness and His mercy. You see that? That's evil, that's wicked, that's blasphemy. And what it says about Jesus saying this, you blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. That's an eternal punishment. That's an eternal sin. It goes on and on and on. In Jude, in verse 7, it talks about this scripture. It says this, it says, the ungodly. It talks about this several times about those on this earth doing ungodly things, just living in rebellion, rejecting God. The ungodly continue to live their lives. And then that same word that is describing those on the earth is the same word that is describing those that are in hell right now. And it's those that are ungodly. So in hell, nothing changes for that person. In fact, I think somebody who's in hell today is getting worse and worse and worse. Because why? It's not a part of their that's for sure. Hell is not remedial. A time for you to get better. Because it's not about our works. So hell, the extreme of punishment. Yeah. Look at the cross. Is that pretty extreme for God to do? Yeah. Why did God do this cross thing? He could chosen. He could just gave us a bunch of rules, couldn't he? We tried that in the Old Testament. Couldn't just have some rules and do the rule thing. And why did Jesus have to die on the cross and punish him to show the extremity of Christ dying on the cross? Isn't that pretty extreme there? The Son of God, the Creator, the Creator of this world. That's why I ask you, Son, why can we look at the cross and say the cross without weeping and realize that we deserve hell and yet He did all this extremity of that? Because the extremity of and he does that. Let me close with this illustration. You know what M A B D stands for? Yeah, mothers against what? Nineteen eighty three. This lady, I think her name was Denise Rockley or something like that. Uh, she started this, and the reason she started this was because her child was killed by a drunk driver. Not only was this guy driving, or this one, I don't know the story there too much about that, but where that driver was driving, he, that person had many, many citations against, they called them DWI, and they called them DUI. The DWI had many citations, nothing was ever done, no punishment was ever given. And it took the loss of her child to, to bring this into fruition, this, this Mothers Against Drunk Drivers. And now, if you, if you look on the webpage, which I did, you see that everywhere in every state, in, in major cities, this organization is there. And they have changed the rules and the laws and our own personal feelings about driving while you're drunk, right? See, we have a generation now, because of this incident, that have changed their mind about driving while they're drunk, right? Now we go, man, that's wrong, how much should I do all that? But years ago, it's, well, you know, slap on your hand. What happened? It took the death of the child for us to realize the consequences of doing it in such a, a bigger way. Such a bigger way. It took the death 
God's Son for realizing the consequences of our choices, of our choices, of our sin, and the result of that is hell. Do y'all see that? If you get on the web page of, of, of Mother's Day and Strong Dharma, there's a lot of pictures of these individuals who lost their lives and it tells a little bit about their story. It's a sad thing to do to see how they're affected by those who are driving while uh, intoxicated or under the influence of drugs. And that's what it is. And so you see all these, these, these faces, and I was just browsing through them, looking at the faces, and oh, it's so sad. That's so sad. You see, when we talk about the doctrine of hell, we've got to understand that we sin against God. But God takes that sin and places it all on Christ. And His Son, His only beloved Son, is what Scripture said, and He died for us. Why? Because He desires no man perish but ever lives on If you're here today, you've never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior. You can't go out this room thinking you're just going to do the best you can and live your life because salvation only comes through Christ. The Bible says there's a day of judgment coming. It's coming. It's almost like a deal of the tissue. You know the tissue. It's up to the sun. The sun is 93 million miles away. If you held that tissue up to that sun, the sun is, is like 65 million degrees or something like that. I mean, it's, you think that's hot? Anybody? Yeah, that's real hot. Million degrees. How long do you think that tissue will last? Just like that. That's our lives before a holy righteous God. Nobody will stand. Nobody will win their own self worth or their own what they've done good or they haven't been that bad. We'll stand before a righteous holy God. That's what we're we'll doing. Consider that. Consider that as you look at your own life. Consider that as you look at others around you that don't know Christ. And that's their destination. Based on the Word of God, I can't send anyone to hell, nor do I want to send anyone to hell. That's why I'm preaching on this. You don't want to go there, church. That's right. Father, we thank you again for your Word. Lord, I think the more we understand about your righteousness and your holiness and your anger towards sin, more we sense this reality of hell that it's real. Or we thank you that the cross changes everything. We thank you for Jesus who took all of our sins, all of our punishment to the cross. Lord, we are, we're so humble with this. Help us to also understand that we sin and it changes everything that we deal with this. We have to deal with it through the cross. Through the blood of Jesus Christ. In the Lord, I pray for anyone in this room today that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior. Lord, would you speak to their heart and their destination for eternity? Lord, let them know deep in their spirit. I pray all this week that they would know where they're going to spend eternity. For all of us in this room, may today be the day of salvation. Our heads are bowed and eyes are Man, if you're here, I just want to say this one more time. I'm done. If you're here and you don't know Christ as your Lord, don't take that chance. You need to ask the Lord to forgive you of your sins, to come into your heart, for Him to live in your life. You're to submit everything to Him as best you can. But you may not understand it all. I don't fully understand all that. But just, just by simple faith, Lord, I ask you to come to my Give you everything. And the word of God clearly says that we call upon the name of the Lord. And we repent and turn from our sin. And yield our lives. We love Him with all of our hearts all the time. The Bible says that He comes in and we have this assurance of everlasting life. Be warned of the consequences of the night. There are many in this room that have trusted Christ. And they know that they've been forgiven of their sins. And they love Jesus with all their heart. And we confront our sin with this with the level of the cross.
Christ in this world. None of our own works through Christ. So if you've not trusted Christ, well, I invite you to do that today before we leave. We're going to ask the guys just to come and we have a time of communion, a time where we uh,